Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali. Uh, as Francesco mentioned, I will be doing a session on Instagram with the help of Jordi. Um, we'll be talking mainly about metrics and engagement. Um, the reason being that I think almost all of us have some kind of experience with Instagram. So we're not going to sit here and explain like what Instagram is. Uh, if you were at my session last week on TikTok, um, obviously it's a bit more of a newer platform. So um, it's it kind of warrants a different conversation. So this is gonna be going a bit more in depth uh, in terms of trying to create more variety in the type of posts that you create and the and the types of content that you're making on Instagram. Uh, Jordi will be helping me throughout that. Um, and because I'm, I have PowerPoints and everything going on in my screens, I might not immediately see your chat, but every um, several slides or so, uh, I'll be addressing Jordi and he'll be helping me out a little bit to discuss some things. Uh, and then we'll take a few minutes maybe to try to address any questions that pop up at that time. Um, but we have a lot to go through today, so hopefully we can get through it in time. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, as Francesco mentioned, my name's Ali. Um, I am the head of business development at Clear Europe. Uh, we're a media and communication training company. Um, we don't just do trainings on social media, we also do trainings on writing, um, media relations, things like that. So if your organization is thinking about that kind of training, feel free to get in touch. Um, but that's enough promo for the moment. Uh, what will we be doing today? Um, Essentially, we're going to talk about the types of Instagram content and kind of how we can use those to, to kind of take our Insta game to the next level. Um, we'll also talk about the pros of going to a professional account rather than just having a, a regular Instagram user account. Um, we'll talk a bit about analytics and then we'll wrap everything up. Um, if we have time, I'll introduce a suggested exercise um, just to kind of get the creative juices flowing and get you a bit more comfortable uh, with what we discussed today. But Obviously, it's not required. It's just something for you to consider for, for later. Uh, Jordi, do you have anything to add before we get started? Maybe maybe a quick intro from my side. Um, yes. My name is Jordi. <laughs> I, um, I'm a, I, I've been a trainer on the Game Changer project. Um, and I'm just here to add a bit of that perspective in the conversation. Um, I work for RNTC. It's a media training center based in the Netherlands. So we're competitors, but also not. <laughs> um, so, so I'm just here to, to um, ask some questions myself, maybe add the game changer perspective. Um, and I will keep my eyes on the chat as well for you, Ali. Great. But by it. all means, you're the leader here. I'm just <laughs> here. I know my place. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jordi. Um, all right, so let's jump right in then. Um, all right, so let's talk Instagram by the numbers. Let's talk, you know, what is Instagram? What does it mean in the context of the social media landscape? Um, unsurprisingly, it's it's exploded in the last almost decade. Uh, once Facebook purchased it uh, all those years ago and turned it into this kind of mobile first visual sharing giant, uh, it's, it's exploded. Obviously, a lot of people had Facebook. It was easy to transition to getting an Instagram account. Um, there's over a billion users now, or a billion monthly active users, I should say. Um, and 75% of those are under the age of 35. So it's a very uh, young, skewed channel, um, much like you know channels like Snapchat and TikTok, though these days TikTok is much more popular than Snapchat. Um, but what's interesting, I think, for, for this audience here, uh, all of us, is that 50% um, of users follow at least one organization. So people are very engaged outside of just their friends, right? People follow uh, companies, organizations, causes they care about uh, on Instagram. Uh, and with that, over 200 million of them are visiting at least one organization profile daily. Um, so what does that mean for us? Uh, there's a lot of potential here, right? There's so much potential for uh, NGOs, and organizations that are working more in cause-based uh, comms, essentially, uh, to really succeed on this platform. So how are you going to leverage it, right? How are we gonna make that difference? If we look at just a quick uh, data set here, uh, this is from Sprout Social. It is essentially, when should you post on Instagram? Uh, this is a global engagement counter that they, they update every year or so. Um, 
is this dogma? Is this something that we should be following very strictly? Not really, but um, this is just something that I think is important to, to note here. Uh, Instagram is highly used during the day, I think when we're all supposed to be working. Um, but what's nice about Instagram is because it's mobile first, people can just kind of quickly kind of flick through their phone and it doesn't feel as invasive uh, versus like if you were on Twitter on your desktop and uh, you know tweeting in the middle of your work day, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but uh, here we are. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because um, there's no kind of perfect rhyme or reason as to when you're going to get the most engagement on Instagram. We obviously want to be kind of mindful about when we post. Posting in the middle of the night probably won't get you engagement, um, but posting kind of in those, those meteor moments where people are um, really actually spending time on their phone. So maybe during their morning commute, during lunchtime, maybe their mid-afternoon break. These are the kinds of things that we need to consider um, when we're posting. But like I said, we don't need to follow this to a T. Um, this is just something that I always get questions about and people always ask, when should I be posting things on social? So here we are. Um, but more interestingly, I think, is the algorithm because I think with every social media platform, um, they all have their own special algorithm that kind of uh, creates your individualized experience uh, when you're using it. Um, these are some pieces from a lovely infographic made by Later. They're a social scheduling platform. Um, in the beginning of the year, Instagram kind of went on record to discuss some of their key algorithm factors, um, of which you can see here. Um, some things to highlight here, uh, engagement gets you ranked higher in a feed. Obviously, a lot of algorithms are like this. It's not surprising. Um, all account types are equal. And by that, I mean, if you have a professional account rather than just a regular Instagram account, uh, Instagram alleges that you'll have the same chance of engagement um, no matter what. Because there was some drama about this a while ago um, where people would switch to a professional account and then they felt like they weren't getting the same level of engagement that they used to. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, and bot interactions will not be counted towards your ranking. So no cheating allowed. Um, thankfully, because the last thing we need is more fake accounts kind of spamming the, uh, the platform. Uh, Jordi, if you want to jump in, do you, do you have any other things you've heard about the algorithm that work well? Um, maybe your personal experiences on this? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, there was some research uh, recently done, um, mm -hmm. and they, they, they separated Instagram accounts with over a million followers and um, the accounts with under a million followers. Um, and the accounts with over a million followers posted more. So on an average, they posted 4.3 stories per day, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 4.1 stories per day, um, 4.3 posts per day. Mm -hmm. And the average of video was around 35%. Um, mm -hmm. Compared to uh, the accounts with under 1 million, and that was just 2.3 posts and 2.8 stories. Mm. So if you want to become really successful on Instagram, <laughs> you probably have to post a lot of content. Definitely. Um, yeah, and, and try, to, try to utilize the entire platform. So, so don't stick to a feed, don't stick to stories. Mm -hmm. Really use everything that's available on that platform. Um, so now we can all aim for over a million followers. Must yeah. be nice. Yeah, must be nice to be an influencer. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That's actually the perfect segue because what we're going to talk about now is um, the types of Instagram posts. Um, I think it's really important for us to recognize that there's so many different ways in which you can, can post things on Instagram. Um, and I'm very mindful that we're very limited on time here today. I could talk about this all day, I'm sure. Um, so I'm only going to talk a bit more in depth on a couple of these different types just to highlight them. Um, and then I'll just mention the others just so you know they're there. Um, but it's important to explore all these features on your own and to get comfortable with what's possible on the platform. Um, there's the Instagram's always releasing new features and new ideas. And so um, hopefully it doesn't become feature bloated like Facebook. But for the, for the moment, it's, uh, it's a good thing because it means that we have the chance to be a bit more creative um, with the types of posts we're doing. So as Jordi just mentioned uh, very, very eloquently, um, 
you know, when Instagram was first kind of becoming a popular thing, um, you know, creating a, a certain aesthetic on your grid and kind of that top nine of your photos, that, that whole aesthetic of like, you know, everything looking very uniform, that was very popular. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, this is the way that you get followers. This is how, you know, you get more engagement is if you have a certain aesthetic. But when everyone is doing that, we kind of evolved past its use, right? If everyone's doing that, how are you going to set yourself apart? Um, so instead, we need to consider the fact that there's a lot of other ways for us to create engaging content. Um, and that includes all of these, right? We have stories and all of the features that go with it. As Jordi mentioned, people who are posting a lot more stories uh, tend to correlate to be the ones that have more followers, right? Um, if you're staying engaged with your audience beyond just your, your grid, your feed, um, just posting pictures, you're going to set yourself apart, right? Um, if we only stick to the grid, of course we're not going to get that much engagement because the algorithm doesn't favor that anymore. You need to have variety in the kinds of posts that you're creating. So we have things like IGTV, right? It's, it's uh, vertical videos um, that are more long form on Instagram. We have uh, Reels, which is kind of uh, Instagram's copy of TikTok, I guess you could say. I think the irony with Reels is I think I've seen more TikToks on Reels than I have actual unique Reels. <laughs> um, stories, obviously, are very similar to Snapchat. Um, so they've been very good at kind of copying other people's ideas and kind of putting it into one visual uh, platform. But of course, we have other things like shopping, direct messaging. They have other apps such as Boomerang and Layouts to kind of, uh, you know, add some flair and movement to your content. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the important thing to take away here is that they're making all these features because they want the experience to be varied and be fresh and exciting for users. So as communicators, we need to take advantage of that. And we need to be using that, um, these different kinds of posts to really kind of entice and engage and entertain uh, our followers. So stories. Uh, so it's as I said, it's very similar to Snapchat, Instagram stories. Um, it's it's an ephemeral type of content, uh, meaning that it's uh, set kind of to a timer. It'll only last for 24 hours on on the top stories of uh, of Instagram of when you open the the app. Um, but it's a good way to create fresh, fun content for your audience. Um, and it kind of allows the, I guess you could say the staleness of the grid to kind of melt away because it's very um, in the moment kind of content, right? Um, <clears throat> you can add polls, filters, GIFs, geolocations, uh, so much more, which we'll talk about in a second. But the thing with stories is that, um, I think the most important thing to remember about stories is the fact that when you open the app on your phone, stories is going to be the very first thing that's on the top, right? And if you're only posting to your grid, um, you're, it's probably going to get lost, right? It, you don't have a guarantee that everyone's going to see your post if you only post on the grid. So stories is kind of almost a, a kind of like a growth hack in a way where you know in some capacity your story is going to be up at the top of someone's in Instagram feed. Um, so kind of as Jordy mentioned with that statistic earlier, um, with having more stories, uh, it really is the secret to getting more people to see your content. Um, you can't rely on the feed algorithm, uh, on its own. Um, and kind of what's another fun little hack, I guess, is you can use stories to tell people that you have a new post, right? I've seen a lot of influencers kind of use this little hack where they'll, post kind of a preview of their picture and maybe cover it up with like a GIF or an image or something. So you have to actually tap on the post to go see what it is and it entices people to go to your grid. Um, so we have a lot of different ways to kind of approach this. And there's there's just so many possibilities, which I think is, is really exciting for stories because this is just things that I came up with at the top on the top of my head, off the top of my head, sorry. Um, these are things that I just thought of while I was making this PowerPoint. These are just different ideas, different um, features that go within stories. Look at how many things we can do. And this doesn't even scratch the surface, I think, of what you can add and do on an Instagram story. Um, you can do behind the scenes content. You can use filters or AR. You can even design your own filters if you have uh, someone in your, in your team with the technical wherewithal to do that. Um, you can ask you can use polls to ask questions. Um, you can 
add donation buttons for good causes and the causes that your organization is working towards. Um, you can create quizzes, you can add your weather forecast. There's so many different possibilities here. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing stories so much here is because I've had plenty of clients in the past say that they don't have time to make stories or that they don't see the value in creating Instagram stories um, because it disappears in 24 hours. But to that, I have two points. Um, first of all, is that you can save any story you want in the highlight section of your profile so it can exist forever if you want it to. Um, but even more importantly than that, my second point is that it's the same thing as making a Twitter or Facebook post. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily make sense when I immediately say it because technically tweets and Facebook posts can stay up forever if you want them to. But my point here is that after a few days, um, people aren't really going to see your content anymore regardless, right? Because the algorithm does not favor that. The algorithm of any social media um, platform focuses on what's new and what's fresh and what's interesting for users, right? So if they're constantly showing you content that's a week old, that's not fun for people, right? Because it's not new and it's not immediate. So if you think about it, uh, an Instagram story kind of has the same permanence as a tweet or almost as a Facebook post, if you think about it, right? Because um, the, the engagement you're going to get from that will probably only last for a day or a few days anyway. So it's just something to think about. Um, we always want to keep people engaged, and even though it maybe seems a bit tiring to create kind of like daily update content, I mean, just look at these ideas, right? Some of these can take you two seconds to do. You can just take a quick photo of a day in the life of, um, you know, maybe people working from home, or, um, you know, telling a story about uh, someone that has been impacted by the work that you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I won't get too deep into this, but just my point here being that we need to really focus on the fact that we need to be fresh and exciting and kind of present new content in new fun ways, right? And then on the other side of that, uh, Instagram TV, IGTV, um, this is kind of Instagram's gamble on long form video. So when you post a video on Instagram, I believe the time limit is still about a minute. Um, but if you want to post a longer form video, you can do that on IGTV. Uh, and so this is exciting because it's kind of one of the first times that a social media channel has created just like a, an aggressive kind of double down on vertical video. Um, will it stay super popular? I'm not sure. But what's nice about it is then it kind of releases you from the the chains of only having to post a video that's that's a minute or two long um, like with Twitter where you have a two minute 20 second uh, limit uh, you have all this extra time that you can create really engaging fun content that's mobile first right and then while I don't suggest uploading a 45 minute explainer video um, about your organization I don't think anyone wants to watch anything like that. Um, there's still some really interesting possibilities here um, without worrying about the, the time constraints, right? Maybe uh, you have a really compelling interview with someone um, that, that then you can air on Instagram TV and have it be a vertical video and uh, you know have, have people tell their stories. I think that's great without having to have that, that same time limit or that same constraint. Um, and because Instagram is built to help people discover the content that they care about. This means that IGTV can be a new avenue for growing your audience that's growing an audience that's passionate about your cause. Um, if you are posting a story, like I mentioned, about um, maybe someone who's been impacted by the work that you do, and someone who is passionate about that cause sees that in their Discover feed, um, you're creating kind of these new ways for people to discover your content and what you're doing. Um, so what does that look like in practice? Um, well, we want to limit the, I'm sorry, I keep losing my mouse. <laughs> we want to remove the limits of mobile first video, right? We want to get creative with how we present this information. So, so one of the companies that's doing a great job with this is BBC News. Um, they use IGTV to highlight top stories on their news site and encourages their audience to discuss and share um, their thoughts about what's happening in the world. Um, so it's kind of like a mini version of their YouTube account. Um, BBC is obviously a broadcast uh, network, so they uh, have a ton of video content already. But the fact that they've repackaged it in such a fun and snappy way, I think, has really set them apart uh, on IGTV. 
And then it's kind of similar with Vox here. They're a media company. Um, they are really, they're well known for their research and their thoughtful explainer videos. Uh, if any of you have Netflix, you've probably seen uh, the Explain series on there. That's through Vox. They do a great job of just explaining complicated concepts. Um, but they do that in kind of the same way, but just in a, in a shorter form uh, on Instagram TV. But what's nice about this is rather than having to explain something in a minute and just be really quick and, and you know, maybe breathless about it, uh, they can do these kind of deeper 5, 10, 15, 20 minute explainer videos that someone could watch while they're on their daily commute, right? Uh, and then IGTV can also be used for just really weird stuff as well. Um, Netflix uh, created a one hour video of them having TV star Cole Sprouse eat a burger. It was literally just a looped video of an hour of him eating. And so <laughs> while I don't think anyone actually would sit there and watch it for an entire hour, I think it was just kind of a fun marketing stunt um, and kind of got people talking. And obviously it kind of uh, was a play on the limits, or I guess the, the lack of limits on what can be done with something like IGTV. Um, so we can always think outside the box here, right? We can always um, maybe come up with some other, you know, kind of creative, clever, weird ways to get people's attention. Um, Jordi, I was gonna bring you in here. Do you have any other examples of things that you've seen on IGTV or even elsewhere? Um, on Insta? Um, may, maybe to go back to your point about the stories, what, yeah. what, what we now often see is that people create a, a series of stories mm -hmm. and they save it as a highlight. Right. So you can create some kind of longer narrative and introduce right. different parts um, mm -hmm. of, of, of a campaign through your stories. So yeah. I think that also speaks to the creativity of the platform. So you can just upload a story once a week about a certain topic and then save them. Um, as a highlight, so yep. people who reach re reach your account for the first time, they can immediately see what you've been doing for the past months. Um, exactly. And again, I really like stories, and I think mm -hmm. I think NGOs and campaigners should use it more often. But it, it 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 feels like a waste from time to time, right? Because it disappears after twenty four hours. If you put right. time and energy and emotion in it, um, but yeah, be creative and try to yeah. to really use all these different elements. Um, and, and once you understand that you can save those stories and create new stories out of stories, yeah, then, then the fun starts. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I think, um, yeah, stories is such a fun, fresh way. And I think it's kind of that mental hurdle that you have to get over of thinking like, oh, it's going to go away mm. because now they've made it so that it doesn't have to go away, right? Um, I actually, this has nothing to do with NGOs, but um, there's a, a vocalist I follow on Instagram, and she actually has a story about um, her dog that she rescued because she saw him running on the side of the highway and started doing an Instagram story about it. And at the time, she didn't know like it would become her dog, but she was doing the story of like, oh, I found this dog. It's it's super crazy. Like, what's going on? And then to see kind of the the evolution of her not being able to find the owners, and so she was like, I guess you're my dog now. And so it was kind of cool because it was like this this like long form story on her highlights Brilliant. of like, yeah. And so it's it's a highlight that I think she's been working on for like a year, but it just became this kind of epic saga of her rescuing this dog. And so. <laughs> but I think that's that's the beauty of how you can use those highlights. Mm -hmm. Just make people want to come back to see mm -hmm. how your story ends or just exactly. try to trigger them to to, to follow your, your, your stories and your um, account. Um, and if you can create a long story arc, like in your example, oh, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think it's great. And I think, uh, yeah, telling a story is always crucial, right? We always want people to connect with what we have to say. Um, yeah, so thank you. Do you have anything else you wanted to add here? Um, I don't know. What, what I always do is just I, I follow these accounts. I think Fox is a very great example yeah. because um, they really adapted their, their um, revenue stream to social media. So they're using uh, a lot of tools and techniques to get people to follow their accounts um, mm -hmm. and still make a bit of money out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the same with BBC. They kind of adapted how they um, disseminate their stories, how they broadcast news. Right. Um, but the cool thing is pretty much everything they do on Instagram, you can replicate it. Because yeah. the tools on Instagram itself, they offer you the same opportunities. 
Um, so just follow those professional accounts and see what you can learn from those. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I, I always tell people the best way to learn how to use social media is to copy from the sources that you admire and that you really like because social media, we all use, we all have the same platform. It's an even playing field, right? So any mm -hmm. of us are capable of creating great content. I know maybe they have a bit of an edge because they're video first kind of companies and so they have people who are videographers and whatever, but um, you know, there's so much, there's so many like tools and software uh, companies out there that can help you very easily make your own content. So anyone's Absolutely. capable of doing this. <laughs> and, and yeah, um, just, just use your mobile. I think Instagram yeah. offers most of these tools from the platform itself. So right. if, you, if you create from your mobile first, um, there's, there's so many options you can use and it all looks pretty professional yeah. and it's, it's all integrated in the platform. So really utilize all those, those hashtags, uh, the polls, the, the sliders, everything. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, thank you. I appreciate your insights on that. Um, all right. So we've talked a bit about IGTV and stories, but what are the other types of posts here um, and features? So I'm not going to dig into all of these because um, we don't have time to explore all of them in depth. And I, for me personally, I don't find that this is necessarily the most crucial thing. I think the thing that you really need to take away from kind of this portion is the fact that um, there's so many different ways in which you can communicate on Instagram. Um, and in order to be successful and interesting and engaging on the platform, you need to use most of these features, if not all. Obviously, as NGOs, you probably don't need the shopping feature. Um, let's be real. Um, but my point here is that posting on your grid and, and only posting on your grid is no longer enough, right? Um, you need to mix it up. You need to create engaging content that comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, Instagram is much more than just photos, so make the most of what is available to you and get creative and have fun with it. Um, and as communicators and content creators, we should be excited about this. Um, it allows us to experiment and try new things um, and not get bored with the content that, that we're making, right? Um, and if you're bored with what you're posting, how do you expect other people to get excited about it, right? Um, post what you would want to see and what you would get excited about if you were in your audience's shoes, right? Um, so if you find that a particular post isn't super engaging or super interesting, you know, maybe it's time to rethink and, and think like, okay, how can we kind of, you know, push this to the next level? How can we, um, you know, make it more interesting? Like it, it's something that you should get excited about, right? Uh -huh. So um, next up, I wanted to look at a few examples um, of some NGOs, nonprofits that are doing some really amazing work on Instagram. Um, first one is World Bicycle Relief. Um, they're a nonprofit that focuses on creating and distributing bicycles to rural and developing communities in order to increase their mobility um, in a safe, efficient, sustainable way. Um, their Instagram is a great example of an organization creating fresh, interesting, engaging content um, around a really meaningful cause. Um, what I really like about their account is that they have very beautiful human-centric storytelling um, through images, captions, uh, their stories and highlights that cover their mission. Um, they involve their followers. They use a lot of user-generated content, which is really cool. Um, they do some behind-the-scenes clips when they do delivery days for the bicycles. Um, they're using their platform essentially just for positive change and, and everything is kind of really encouraging and exciting and really makes you passionate about what they're doing uh, when you look at their content, right? Um, and it's also a great way for them to collect donations because that's that's what they work off of. Um, and it helps them kind of get the word out about uh, their cause and what they're doing. So you can see here, um, you know, they have their grid, obviously, they, they post occasionally, but Personally, like 510 posts isn't that much for an account that has over 33,000 followers, right? Like that's it's pretty impressive. <laughs> so um, really what is, I think, kind of their bread and butter is that they've created some really engaging video content um, and Instagram stories that kind of really focus on the stories of the people that they're impacting. Um, and that's something that I think all of us can really connect back with, um, especially as NGOs, I think, you know, all of us are working at these companies or at these organizations that we're very passionate about. Um, we're working towards causes to make the world a better place. 
Um, so that, that passion should come through and whatever you create. Right. Um, but with Instagram, what's nice is you can really show and not tell people you can demonstrate all of the great things that, that your organization is working towards. So let's look at another example, roots and shoots. So um, this is the youth initiative from the Jane Goodall Institute. For those of you who don't know, um, they're brilliant at using their Instagram account. They promote their content in a really fun and engaging way, but they're never, you know, condescending or to, um, they don't talk down to their, to their followers. They're very informative and um, engaging. And what's also great is they post a lot of value adding resources for, for parents and teachers and, and children, obviously. Um, so you can find, you know, uh, for example, the one on the upper left hand corner, it's a, a document that you can, I think, download that was social distancing tools, tips and more. And it was kind of put in a kid friendly um, package or design. Um, and it was packed with different activities and advice and ways to um, kind of keep the stress levels down during a, a very stressful time for all of us. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's great because they they do a lot of really interesting campaigns on the importance of sus sustainability because that's that's their core cause. Um, but they also offer mental health resources. Um, they encourage small acts of kindness in your communities. Um, so they're very masterful at creating a kind of an, a positive, engaging, valuable space for young people on Instagram. Um, so for those of you who work uh, with causes that tie back to youth interests and young people. I think this is a really great Instagram to learn from um, just because we don't just want to, you know, talk at people and be like, Hey, we need your help. We need you to do this. We need you to do that. We also need to uh, use our platform to provide resources and valuable information for the people that would be following us um, and for the audiences that would be passionate about what we're talking about. Right. So keep in mind. And finally, another example I wanted to show was uh, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, I think is how you say it in French. Pardon my terrible French. Um, but basically, they uh, consistently really show the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what they do. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this up as an example is because it doesn't always have to be positive, right? A lot of us um, in the NGO space are probably working in, in very um, difficult situations. Uh, depending on kind of what what the cause is um, but let's say you know you're working with refugees or um, on the climate crisis things that are are very urgent and very serious um, doctors without borders um, really kind of puts all of that into like this breathtaking visual kind of storytelling space um, they highlight the people that are behind their mission from every corner of the world um, they, they really try to go um, show all these people who are trying to make the world a better place. Um, it's really gripping content, and it, it shows that not everything has to be fun and lighthearted on, on Instagram. Um, if you have a compelling story to tell, either, either happy or more serious, it's possible to showcase that in a way that gets people's attention. Um, and being real and open with people allows your audience to, to kind of become more of a community and mobilizes people into turning these conversations into actions, right? Um, so yeah, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I, I always get questions where it's like, well, I work in a very serious thing, like how should I use Instagram? Because it's not a very serious platform, but it can be, right? Um, National Geographic isn't always fun and games and lightheartedness. Like they've, they've had shown some pretty striking images on their Instagram as well. Um, highlighting the, the climate crisis, for example. So we can talk about these very serious issues in a very compelling way um, without having kind of that sunshine and rainbows sort of, uh, I guess, lightheartedness with whatever we're talking about, right? We can, we can be serious. It just needs to be um, addressed in kind of the, the right light, right? So something to keep in mind uh, for those of you maybe that are working on, on more difficult causes and more difficult topics, um, it is possible, I think, to use Instagram and, and really mobilize uh, people to to help out and to you know take action with whatever it is you need them to do so So some final thoughts on engagement with Instagram um, As I, I've been saying a million times mix it up, right? Just don't stick to the grid Use the different tools you have available to you the different features you can make some really professional cool engaging content without you know spending thousands of euros, right? 
Uh, human-centric storytelling always performs well, but this goes for any social media channel. We are humans. We relate to stories. Storytelling is what gets us through things. It's how we, how we you know, shape our reality. So always try to tell a story. Always try to connect your message back to a story whenever you can, because that's always going to be much more compelling for people than um, you know, just posting a group picture and saying like, yay, we did it, right? Like nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> so <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, try to create content that's easy to digest and it's shareable to a larger audience. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, if you have some value adding content that you can create and share with your audience, um, try to, you know, package it in a way that's very shareable or very easy for people to distribute to other friends. Um, even encourage them to share it. Um, I think, you know, I saw a great example on Roots and Shoots where they were talking about mental health awareness and they, they had a short video clip about, um, you know, how to see signs of maybe somebody who's withdrawing a bit or maybe battling with depression. And so it was, you know, a bunch of resources and tips for that. And then they would encourage people to share that with their friends to make sure that, you know, their friends also aren't experiencing those things and then they can check on their friends and so on and so forth. So it's that network effect. Um, we can create very positive spaces on Instagram. Um, we just have to be the ones that are kind of, you know, steering the ship in that direction, right? And don't lose sight of your goals. Uh, everything should always be done to serve your, your communication goals, right? Uh, if you post something that isn't necessarily in line with, with what you're trying to accomplish, then it maybe, you know, doesn't serve your time or resources very well. We need to really stay focused on the message and the cause and make sure that we, um, you know, get what we need to get done. Um, that's not to say, like, you need to be militant about it. You can still create very interesting, varied content, but uh, we don't want to kind of lose the thread, if that makes sense. Uh, and showcase your passion for your cause. I'm sure all of you have a very deep passion for what it is that you do because you're working for very worthy causes. So if you don't believe in something, how can you get others to buy into it? We need to have that buy-in. Um, amongst ourselves so that we can create content that really, you know, shines through with that passion and that interest, right? And then just as a little bonus thing, as I kind of already touched on, uh, do you like something that someone else is doing? Try it for yourself. And Jordy mentioned that as well. It's, it's, it's very easy, I think, to kind of just sort of copy things that you like on Instagram and, uh, and take those ideas and maybe kind of package it into your own way with your own flair, right? Um, Jordy, do you have any other tips from your side or other examples uh, that you maybe want to talk um, about before we move on? I, I think maybe a small disclaimer. Um, I, um, I mm -hmm. think authenticity is key for Instagram. So what you often see mm -hmm. is that the big NGOs, big organizations, they see this, this um, challenge or this hashtag and they try to hop on board that, that hype and they try to use that hashtag to their advantage. Um, right. Quite often losing their authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of government communications on Instagram are pretty cringe worthy. So um, try to, to stay authentic, try yeah. to keep it close to you. Um, don't hop on uh, the next TikTok challenge if it doesn't fit with your organization. Um, right. it, Probably it makes it sounds logical that you want to do something with this challenge, <laughs> right. but if it doesn't fit your organization, don't do it. Um, exactly. Yeah. So that's a minor note. Um, and and, and again, yeah, human centric storytelling is mm -hmm. key, especially for for Instagram. Um, and it can really um, through that you can really create emotional stories um, that really show a different perspective on NGOs, mm -hmm. on campaigns, instead of this big organization just broadcasting their message, it makes it personal. Um, and people, people, and especially younger audiences, really like that. They connect to it. And that's, that's how you build a community on Instagram. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, as Jordi mentioned, uh, it's, yeah, it's important to always kind of stay focused. If you see something that maybe you can kind of newsjack in a way or jump on board with, um, if it's not serving kind of your greater purpose or your greater goal of what you're trying to achieve on these platforms, then obviously it's something that you should skip. So <laughs> we always need to make sure we have that focus. <laughs> um, all right. Well, so that's, that's kind of 
wrapping up that section, um, now we're gonna, oops, sorry. Now we're gonna talk a bit more about um, switching to a professional account because for those of you who have not done that yet on your organization accounts, you should. And I hopefully after these next few slides can convince you that you should be doing it. Um, so why should you go to a professional account? Why should you switch? Um, because it's free, first and foremost. Uh, sorry, that's like a very American joke to say that something's free 99, but excuse me. <laughs> um, but it's it's free to switch, right? There's there's nothing uh, that you have to pay to, to have a professional account. Obviously, there are paid features that you can access, such as running ads or boosting uh, certain posts. Um, but yeah, you, it doesn't cost anything, right? And as I said before, the algorithm uh, has made it so that there's there's no distinction on engagement between professional accounts and regular accounts. Uh, and then probably the biggest reason you should, should switch is the fact that then you'll have access to analytics on the back end. Um, so you can see how many times people are clicking your link, how many times people are seeing your profile, you can get demographic breakdowns. Um, so now this is a really great way for you to, in a free way, see the analytics on the back end of Instagram um, without having to really do that much work, right? So that's great. It's nice. Yay, less work. Um, also, it helps you reach the right people and promote your organization. Um, so as I said, you'll have access to the Instagram ad platform when you switch to your professional account. Um, but what's also interesting is that you can add a button for people to email you, to look at your website. Um, you can add a shop if that's something that you want to do. Maybe you guys have some, some merch. Um, but you can, you can add these different elements uh, as well as um, an address so people know how to get in touch with you. Um, and so I think it's, it's a great way for you to really kind of, I guess, more like hyper-focus the kinds of audiences that you want to look for um, when you have more places to kind of fill out on your account. Um, it's, yeah, it's always better, right? It makes you more discoverable. Uh, yeah, and I kind of already touched on that. But uh, so you can add contact buttons, you can add your industry, um, and followers can reach out with a simple tap. So it just makes it much more easier. I, I think it also makes it more legitimized in a way because then it's like, oh, I'm, you know, this is an organization. This is like a an entity rather than just a person, right? Um, so these are just a few of like the quick reasons why you should switch if you haven't already. Um, and as I kind of touched on a second ago, you, you know, probably the biggest benefit to switching is to have Instagram insights, which allows uh, businesses and organizations to have all of the essential data you would need um, to, to have all of your, you know, analytics and, and understand kind of how your posts are performing. Um, it's obviously a bit limited, like it can only show you so much, but it does um, show your performance over a period of time, change in followers, number of posts, your impressions, um, reach, profile views, things like that. Um, it also gives you a detailed demographic breakdown, which is very nice, so you can see the kinds of people who are following you and, and maybe where they're based. Um, so then you can see like, oh, maybe we have a ton of followers in, the UK for some reason, you know, why is that? And you know, how can we mobilize those people or maybe do a localized event there that, that gains some interest, right? Um, it also lets you view your historical posts by engagement and impressions over a time period. Um, I think it's up to two years now. They, they keep changing it, I think it's two years now, but you can actually see historically how things are performing over time and how your channel is growing. Um, and of course, there are times where you may want an even more detailed analytics uh, you know, review of your Instagram performance, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. I'll give you kind of some tools and suggestions for kind of some third party uh, softwares that allow you to do that. So, uh, but how do you switch, right? Uh, I've been talking about this, uh, you know, what, where is this? What are you talking about, Allie, right? Um, well, it's very easy. So if you go to your settings on Instagram, you will find the account button. And if you click on that, you will then go to your account. And if you scroll all the way down, you will see in this beautiful blue thing here, switch to your professional account. So it's very easy to do. Um, when you click on that, you'll have to fill in a few details that are required, um, such as your industry, uh, a place to contact you, things like that. But then you're, you're all set up and then you can already start diving into the performances of your, of your um, posts. So 
it's pretty handy and something that I always evangelize to uh, anyone who's who's running an organization account. Um, you know, influencers do this as well. You don't even have to be a company or organization to have a professional account. Um, I've done it a few times. I've just kind of played around with my personal Instagram and switched to a professional account just to see some analytics and just, you know, kind of have a, a better grasp of, you know, how my personal account's performing. Um, but I feel like the main point here is that you have nothing to lose but so much to gain by switching. Um, so that's why I think it's very important just to like touch on this very quickly. Um, Jordi, do you have anything else you want to add about switching to your professional account or any experiences you've had with that? Um, for me, uh, the most powerful tool you, you gain when you switch to professional account is that you can link your Instagram account to your Facebook account. That's so if you're helpful, running yeah. a campaign uh, mm -hmm. on Facebook, um, you can set up ads through yeah. the Facebook ad manager yeah. to Instagram. Um, so if you're running ads, you, you kind of have to switch mm -hmm. to a professional account, but then you gain a lot of tools in the, the Facebook ad manager. Yeah. Um, so that's that's super nice to have. Um, and maybe another tip is to aim for a verified mm -hmm. logo. You know, the, the mm -hmm. blue logo we all want to have mm -hmm. on our account? Uh, it's kind of a myth. Mark. Yeah, the blue check mark. <laughs> Ooh, so precious. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of a myth that you need at least 5,000 followers. That's, that's not the case. You can just apply for it in the same uh, settings yeah. menu you see on the screen. And then you have to send over some documentation uh, about the organization. But mm -hmm. when you get verified, you get a nice blue check mark. Yeah, and that that is something that money can't buy, truly, <laughs> is verification. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah, but that's a really great point, I think, about the Facebook ad platform. Um, I, you know, personally for my company, we don't use Facebook a lot um, for, for our business just because it doesn't really make sense for what we do. But... Um, there's a lot of companies out there that really have a ton of value in using the Facebook ad platform, both for Facebook and Instagram. There's so much, I, I really think it's one of the most robust ad platforms out there, which is what caused Facebook to explode the way it did and how it's so rich and how Zuckerberg is still yeah. somehow in charge. But um, it's, it's, really, it's really a fantastic platform because you can, you can really hyper target and really focus on the right audiences and having that ability within Instagram makes it such a powerful tool. Um, especially if you maybe have a smaller budget, you can really do a lot of work for not a lot of money, I think, or get a lot, you know, a lot of results for not a lot of money. Whereas if you mm -hmm. look at a channel like um, LinkedIn, where it's like $10 a click and just like very aggressive kind of B2B sales sort of um, analytics, it's just a completely different ball game, right? And so it's a much more, an expensive, effective way to uh, to get to the right people. So. Yeah. yeah, and also if you're, if you're running a campaign or your social media accounts with a small team, um, you can do all your moderation from Facebook. So mm -hmm. you get uh, notifications when people comment on your Instagram posts yeah. through that um, professional account on Facebook. So you can just moderate two platforms at the same right. time. Right. So you don't it's always have to be very on your nice phone. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to be like kind of like reading through all of the uh, the fine print and all of the analytics and maybe your thumb presses the wrong thing and <laughs> you spend 10,000 euros on a campaign. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so this was a very short section, but I think it's a very important section. I think it's something that we should keep in mind um, when we're using Instagram, especially as an organization. Um, Switch to a pro account, try to get verified. I think that's really one of the, the bigger social currencies you can have on uh, these platforms is to, is to have that blue check mark, uh, that elusive blue check mark. And, and it can really kind of give you that, that authority and gravitas uh, on whatever cause it is that you are uh, working towards, right? So uh, this, kind of last part that I really wanted to dig into is um, metrics. And I'll be using the words metrics and analytics kind of interchangeably. So, so don't be like, oh, what's this, what's that? Like, the, it's the same thing. Analytics are metrics, metrics are analytics. Just, yeah, a colloquialism, I guess. Um, but one thing to keep in mind as we're discussing this topic is uh, the fact that there are good analytics and not so good analytics. 
Um, we separate these into two different categories, or I do, um, and many others do. Uh, we think of these metrics as either vanity metrics or as actionable metrics. So what in the world am I talking about when I say vanity metrics and actionable metrics? Well, um, vanity metrics are essentially the things that look really pretty, but don't actually get you closer to your communication goals. So data such as, you know, followers, page views, subscribers, any like flashy thing that looks like it, you know, makes you look really good and you think like, oh, we have 10,000 followers. Great, but are they the right kind of followers? And what is that in proportion to what has happened previously, right? So it doesn't really tell the story of, of kind of how you're performing and how your uh, Instagram is doing. Um, so they offer really you know, positive reporting. It looks good on paper, um, but there's no context. And there's nothing within this kind of data that allows you to make actionable decisions um, based on what you're looking at, right? So that's something that actual metrics kind of you know, fix in that regard. Um, Rather than focusing on data points that really don't make any sense in terms of the larger goals that you're trying to accomplish, um, we then want to focus on actionable metrics such as traffic. Um, so, you know, traffic is crucial because social media is a vital traffic driver to blogs and websites, um, places uh, where people can donate, landing pages, things like that. Traffic is really crucial, I think, to understanding how your content is performing and how much you're engaging. Um, with the people that follow you. Uh, you also have follower growth. Um, so this is different than just followers, right? It's a contextual me metric. Um, it's, you know, the more people following your accounts, the more you can reach, uh, more people you can reach more easily. Um, but this is different from just your follower account, as I said, it's the measurement of your growth in proportion to your audience size. So you can say, oh, we have 10,000 followers, but um, you know, how many followers did you have a year ago? Uh, you know, 9,824, that's not a ton of growth, right? Like we're not, we're not doing what we need to be doing to, to kind of take our content uh, and our message to the next level. So we need to always think uh, in relation to kind of everything that's, that's happening around that, right? Um, plus if those followers aren't the followers that you actually need to be following you, then, then that doesn't really make sense. But if you see that there's a high growth over time, that probably demonstrates that you're doing something right, right? Uh, unless you unless you paid a, a click farm to uh, to get you more followers, but let's not do that. <laughs> um, and then engagement, obviously, this is the social part of social media. Um, this is likes, shares, mentions, comments. Um, these are all equal opportunities to build connections with your audience um, and any kind of prospects if you're trying to gather donations. Um, this can include industry influencers, um, current or potential supporters, uh, audiences for, that are just interested in your content or your cause. Um, so the engagement is very crucial um, to kind of seeing, you know, well, I guess you could call it the performance of your posts, right? It's how it's performing. We also have conversions. Um, so this is more in the context of, of marketing, right? When you're, when you're trying to drive sales. Um, but in the context of NGOs, it would be more like donations, awareness, policy wins, things like that. Um, and converting organic social media traffic can be tough, um, but it is very possible. Um, more and more we're seeing that paid advertising is, is much more conversion centric, um, but there's obviously challenges of its own with that as well. Um, so it's it's just something to consider in terms of you know how much are we are we paying to convert people or to um, you know gather donations get people to click on our landing page whatever it is that you consider a conversion um, for your for your organization um, this is something that is very contextual and really tells a story of you know are people uh, you know touched by your content are they responding to it in in a passionate way are they stepping up and taking action are they doing something about it right. So that's really important to, uh, to consider. And then finally, um, reach and impressions. Uh, social media content exists to be seen. Um, that's not the most groundbreaking sentence in the world, <laughs> um, but getting in front of more viewers means there's more awareness for your organization and content. Um, these may seem like soft metrics, but there is value in gaining exposure. Obviously, you want as many eyeballs on the screen as possible. 
Um, as long as you're not being discussed in a bad way, I guess there's there's pos it's possible to go viral for the wrong reasons, obviously. Um, but your reach and impressions can really kind of show like that that potential audience pool that you have access to, right? You can get an idea of you know on average how many people are are actually looking at your content. Um, so it can be a very a very actionable um, way to approach your metrics. Um, but you'll probably notice a theme here, right? It's all data with context, and that's the key here. We always want all of the data that we're presenting to be contextual. Um, we want it to, to kind of tell that bigger story of whatever it is that we're um, doing or whatever we're communicating. So it's really important to think more about, you know, when you see a metric or when you're looking at a certain, um, you know, piece of, of analytics or, or some d different pieces of data, um, you know, is it telling that story? Is it, um, you know, kind of giving us the information that we need to make those decisions, right? And something to, to remember here is that there is a difference between being data driven and being data informed. Um, basically, in a, data, in a data driven business or organization, um, data leads the decision making process. Um, in other words, uh, you know, decision makers see that data as, as kind of its holy grail. Um, and they can extract that information to steer whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, Data-driven businesses use that data across the entire organization. Um, so, you know, let's say for for a big tech company, probably data is going to be a very big piece of what they do because that's that's kind of their their whole business model, right? Um, but it doesn't always tell the whole story, which is why I always encourage people to be data informed, um, because being data informed means using data as a factor in the decision making rather than using it as the entire basis for what you're doing. Um, in data-informed organizations, teams can take other factors like brand consistency, um, subjective audience experiences, um, so more of like the qualitative data rather than just the quantitative. Um, some fun statistics keywords there. <laughs> um, but it's good to take these other things into consideration when making decisions uh, on your comms, um, you know, programs and strategies, I think. Data is great and valuable and very important, um, but it doesn't always tell the whole story, right? You, and by you, I mean everyone that's listening to this right now, has the ability to, to dig a bit deeper um, beyond just data when it comes to being successful on, on social media. Um, you all understand uh, you know, how your organization is performing and kind of what's being done and what's being accomplished, and so, this is something that that kind of requires a larger contextual conversation. Um, Jordi, I don't know if you have anything to add here. Um, I think, yeah, it's it, the thing is, is that I'm very pro data. I'm very excited about data, and I think it's an important element to, uh, yeah, any any kind of comms decisions. But it, I don't think it should be the only thing, right? Um, and maybe you have some experience with this as well. <laughs> Um, if, if you want to ignore the data or <laughs> um, 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 treat data as, as a side note, um, it's, it's nice to, to focus on the, the conversations you have on your social medias. Mm -hmm. So um, um, how are right. people responding to your content? Um, do they like it? Um, do they get your message? Um, are they sharing your message? Are they contributing to your, to your story, to your goals, to your ambitions? Um, can you engage in a, in a conversation with them? That's of course time consuming, but it's so nice to have. Um, instead of just broadcasting, you can actually engage mm -hmm. with them. Um, right. So yeah, definitely also focus on, 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 on how your audience responds to your campaign and to your, to your social media channels. Right. Um, and if you want to include data, um, personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of engagement rates. Yeah. So instead of looking at uh, the total amount of engagement, total amount of reach, um, you can divide the engagement by the amount of reach and then yeah. times 100, you get a percentage. And it shows you the percentage of your audience who actually responds or does something with your content. Um, and in my campaigns, I always use some kind of a diary. So mm -hmm. um, I publish something, and then after two weeks, I look back at that content, and I just not down those numbers. And then I create an engagement rate to see how that content did, and I try to learn from that. So what's yeah. powerful, what's potent content for your 
campaigns or for your channels. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that brings up a good point in that it, that that's what makes it more contextual, right? Like that's what kind of gives it that story element of um, understanding kind of where you stand. Um, and especially with engagement rates, um, you can't do this on Instagram insights, what you just mentioned, looking at uh, the rates over time. But uh, there are some third party tools out there that can actually show you your proportion of engagement versus the previous period, right? So if you're maybe looking at quarterly performance or monthly performance of social media channels, you can actually see how it's performing versus previous um, terms, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes as well. But um, that's something to keep in mind is that it's possible to, to do these kinds of things and you don't need like fancy equipment or tools to do it. You can really just kind of crunch the numbers and like do it mathematically yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, but if you want to save a bit of time and you have the money, there are some tools that do it for <laughs> you, which is great. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think that's a great point. Engagement uh, really kind of and engagement rates are a way to really kind of tell more of a story. And obviously, you know, kind of going back to my point about y you all knowing your cause better than, than anyone else because you're working within them. Um, you are the ones that, that can see kind of the content and uh, the comments and what people are saying about your cause, right? And so that's the kind of stuff that you can also kind of take to heart and consider when you're making those decisions. Um, and social listening is always a great thing to do if you don't already do it. Um, and by social listening, I mean actually doing some keyword searching and seeing what people are saying about your organization, about your cause, um, maybe what they're saying about uh, competitors, uh, organizations that work in similar causes. Um, and these are things that you can really harvest a lot of really interesting lessons from uh, just because there is so much to be learned from just hearing what people have to say, right? You can really get a lot of interesting insights that way. So data is very important, but it doesn't need to be the whole story, right? So it's, uh, yeah, I'm very pro metrics, but they shouldn't dictate everything you do. <laughs> Great. Um, so I would just want to talk about some tools. I was kind of touching on these throughout, um, but there are some some third party tools and, and you guys will have access to these slides. So I don't feel like you have to like scribble these down, but um, there's a lot of really great tools out there that you can use for Instagram. Um, all of these tools either have a limited version uh, or a free trial. Um, so you can play around with what's out there. Uh, and see what makes sense for you and your organization. Um, I absolutely love Sprout Social. I think they're one of like the best in the industry in terms of analytics, social listening, um, content curation, things like that. Um, but it is a very expensive tool, and there are other tools that do similar things, right? So you have things like Hootsuite, um, Buffer. Um, you know, there's there's all these different things. You can also look at Hype Auditor, which is kind of a fun tool to look at. You can see how like what proportion of uh, f your followers are real, or you can even put in like a celebrity's handle and see that they have like 60% bots following them. So <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of a fun little like game you can play. Um, Jordi, do you have any tools that you're a huge fan of? Um, I, I would love to hear your thoughts as well on this part. <laughs> so I, I, I really like these tools. And for me, mm -hmm. Hootsuite is, is kind of the, 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 the most, easy to get yeah it's um, definitely but, but, possible. but again these tools quite often need either a financial investment or a lot of investment in terms of time mm -hmm. um especially looking at these tools from the angle of the the game changer project um i'm i'm i'm, I'm pretty happy with the tools that the social media platforms offer themselves mm -hmm. um, so if you're working with 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 not a big budget or you're working with young campaign teams i would say just focus on the the metrics you get from social media um but, but be sure to to really interpret those metrics um correctly so don't mm -hmm. look at reach but to try to understand what these metrics are telling you right um and that, yeah, that also depends on how you set up your campaign. So how do you design your campaign? And how can we include metrics um, to indicate whether our campaign is a success or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think so the, the, the platforms, especially, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Facebook, sorry, um, but those metrics are, are, <laughs> are, are so extensive. And it, it yeah. pretty much tells you the entire story. And I'm happy to see that the, the, the metrics on Instagram are kind of heading in that same direction. Yeah. Through the integration with Facebook, so 
Definitely. Yeah, no, I agree. I think Facebook, I, in, in my opinion, has one of the best kind of back end free analytics tools out there. It's, it's very, very insightful. And, and yeah, Instagram's going in that direction. I hope it gets as robust as Facebook because then there really yeah. wouldn't be a huge need for third party tools. Um, and I agree in that, you know, you don't need any of these tools to be successful. Um, it's just about uh, maybe outsourcing a bit and saving a bit of your time if you have the ability and, and the budget to do it. Um, this is more just to say like, this is out there if you need it. Uh, and mm -hmm. there are different options out there. Um, but I know, yeah, obviously on the back end of these tool of these platforms, you can you can do all of the things that these tools do for free uh, if you have the time to, to put it together. Um, but yeah, it's just something to keep in mind if maybe you have a bit of budget to put against something and it will just save you a bit of time in the long run. Um, but there's so many different tools out there. So these aren't the only ones. Um, if you, if you feel strongly about, you know, exploring these options, I would suggest signing up for a bunch of free trials and just trying them out and seeing if it makes sense for your organization. Um, I know Sprout, for example, does a one month free trial because it, obviously takes time to collect data and then you can kind of see how robust it is and, and what your options are. Um, but uh, like Buffer and Hootsuite, for example, have completely free versions that are available. Um, they're not obviously going to be as robust as their paid versions, but if you're someone who wants to schedule social media posts, but you don't have that ability on the front end of a, of a certain channel, I know Twitter lets you schedule and I believe Facebook now does too as well. Um, but let's say maybe on LinkedIn you want to schedule something or you're trying to post something across multiple channels, it can save you a bit of time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is that these are available if you need to use them. Um, do you have to use them to be successful? Absolutely not. Um, but I think as a social media trainer, it would be kind of silly of me to not at least mention them, but <laughs> they're there if you need them. Um, and just to give you a quick, quick example um, with Sprout, so, as, we, as I kind of touched on earlier, um, there's ways in which you can kind of check how your rates are performing in proportion to previous um, terms or previous quarters or months or however it is that you measure uh, your analytics. Um, so these are just kind of some examples of Instagram business profiles or Instagram professional accounts now that they're called. Um, but you can see these summaries of, you know, link clicks, engagement, impressions. These are all things that, that you can see on the back end of Instagram for free if you have a professional account. But I think what's important to note here is you also have these engagement or these um, rates versus previous terms. So you can see here on this example, the impressions are up 57% from the previous uh day or month or whatever it was that this was set to. Um, so it's really interesting analytics because I think it gives you a bit more context. You can also look at competitors' profiles and compare how they're performing. Um, and you can also look at different tags, uh, which means like different keywords that you're searching for. So if you're looking for something a bit more robust, it is out there if you're interested. Um, but by no means is this something that you need to use to be successful on these platforms. So. Oops. All right, so wrapping up kind of this portion and then I'll introduce a suggested exercise for you to maybe think about and then we'll have a bit of time for some questions if anyone has any. Um, yeah, so it's pretty standard, right? Go beyond the grid. Um, there's so many cool features now on Instagram. It's crucial to try and take advantage of all of them. Um, you won't find success on Instagram if you're only posting the occasional photo to your feed. It's just not gonna work. I, I do not know a single account out there uh, unless you're after, like super famous. I don't know an account out there that can just post one photo every like few weeks and then just immediately get like a million followers, right? Um, it's just not a thing. If you're an organization, you, you have to put in the work and you have to, to really uh, create that engaging content that, that encourages people to actually follow you, right? Uh, switch to a professional account. We kind of hammered this home quite a bit, but you have nothing to lose and so much to gain by switching to a professional account. Um, you get those analytics you deserve. You can use Facebook's super robust platform. Um, you can give potential followers the opportunity to get in touch with you more easily. There's just so many benefits to switching that um, it's it really, I think, is a big key to success for organizations on, on Instagram. Uh, learn from other companies and organizations you admire. 
uh, steal like an artist, as I say. Uh, is there an organization that you really admire? Um, or are they doing some interesting, cool, uh, let's say like giveaway or contest or something that you think is really fun and interesting? Maybe it's something that you could try out for your organization. Um, obviously, as, as Jordi and I pointed out, um, it still should serve whatever your goal is. It shouldn't just be you like copying a bunch of people's ideas and hoping something sticks, right? It still needs to serve that greater cause and that greater purpose of, of whatever it is you're trying to communicate. So always keep that in mind. Um, follow the right metrics. So remember, there's those vanity metrics and those actionable metrics. So we need to make sure um, that we're not just looking at metrics that are good on paper. We're using metrics that are um, contextual and actually tell a story and helps us, they help us make those um, important decisions uh, when it comes to what we're doing with our comm strategy uh, on these platforms. And then finally, find the tools that work for you. Um, find a tool stack that makes sense for you and your team. Um, keep in mind your needs, budget and time constraints and goals. Uh, obviously, as we said, you can be really successful on these platforms without ever spending a single euro, um, but you just have to be really, really creative and you have to put in the work. Um, if, you, if you just post a couple times and, and you're like, okay, you know, done for the day, time to clock out, it's not really going to get you the kind of um, engagement that, that you need uh, to, to really get people's attention and to kind of be that catalyst for change um, for your cause. So important things to keep in mind. Finally, uh, this is just a quick suggested exercise that I put together. Uh, you are welcome to do it. You don't need to turn this in or anything, but it's just something to kind of help your creative juices flow a bit. Um, if you have an upcoming comms campaign, try to launch it on Instagram. Try to think about, uh, you know, maybe a certain cause or promotion or campaign that, that your uh, organization is working through and try to create some fun content that aligns with that. Um, try to take your messages and, and present them in new, fun, and engaging ways. Um, tell stories, showcase your passion, um, you know, show all of the amazing, cool things that, that your organization is doing uh, and present that to the world in a really fun, engaging way, right? Um, you can see, you can try out how many different ways you can get your audience involved. You can, uh, you know, post user-generated content. You can do quizzes. Um, and so my, my challenge to you is if you launch a campaign on Instagram, I want you to try to come up with 15 to 20 deliverables for the campaign, but not just for your grid, right? That would be super boring and annoying. Uh, I want you to think of photos, videos, stories, reels, maybe a certain hashtag for the campaign that you tie back to it. Um, think of all these different elements so you can combine them to create something that's really engaging and robust and fun for your audience to check out. Um, and also be sure to determine how you will measure success of the campaign and don't just focus on those vanity metrics. You want to think of things that are going to really kind of catapult you to the place that you, you're trying to get to um, with what it is you're doing. So with that, that is the end of my slides. Uh, thankfully, I got through them quick enough to have some time to answer any questions that you may have. Um, Jordi, if you want to give any of your final thoughts as well on on this topic, I would love to hear it. <laughs> sure thing. Um, um, great exercise, by the way. Um, maybe to yeah. add a suggestion to that, try to create everything from a mobile phone. Instagram is a platform mm. that's, that's being consumed on mobile phones. And it's also a platform where it's super easy to create content mobile first. So pretty mm -hmm. much the most effective tool you can have is your mobile phone. Um, so just, um, and there's so many options you can use on Instagram. Just, just try to have fun with it. Um, create an account if you don't have any. Um, maybe create a private account where you just can mess about with all the settings and tools you have. Explore all the opportunities there because there are so many opportunities, mm -hmm. um, so many tools you can use, so many options. Um, and and Instagram is supposed to be fun as well. So right. that's 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 my final say. I would say. <laughs> Your say, I would say. I love that. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I think that's that's a great point. Um, yeah, I think I think all of you should try to challenge yourselves. Uh, the next campaign you guys run, try to encourage your team to, to try on Instagram and see how it works. Because you never know. Maybe it becomes the the de facto platform that you focus your energy on. Maybe it's the place that you need to be to 
to kind of catalyze that change that you're looking for. So something to keep in mind, you never know. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? Feel free to, actually, Francesco, if you want to jump back on, I'm not entirely sure if I need to be giving people permission or if you do or if they can just put it in the chat, but we've had a very quiet bunch today. Um, but TikTok yeah. last week, people were like spamming the chat with questions. <laughs> it's been very quiet today. <laughs> yes, yes. No, they can, I, I will be the one accepting Perfect. all of you who are yeah. listening. Of course, you can also post some questions in the chat. I actually have one. Uh, for you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. It was super interesting. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Georgi, for your tips. And I just had a question uh, connected to, to NGOs who use Instagram. You mentioned in your presentation something about Medi Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, but also other big organizations. I mean, I, I know for a fact that, for example, Amnesty International is uh, uh, very active and has a lot of very engaging content on social media. But apart from this uh, huge, big organization that have their audiences already, uh, no matter if they use social media or not, uh, do you have any example of maybe small NGOs or local NGOs who are um, effectively engaging people on social media, for example? Maybe if you have, you could share uh, some link because you talk also about like stealing as an artist so <laughs> it could be nice to 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 see how other small organizational grassroots organizations are doing this right um so i would say actually the first example i presented uh let me get back to it. world bicycle relief they're a very small team i think there's only 10 to 20 people in their organization it's not a big team at all they've just really managed to kind of turn it into something that that is much bigger than itself. And I think Instagram was a big um, way for them to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, a couple of my examples were kind of those bigger ones that have a lot of resources and a lot of um, yeah money and ability to, to create all of these different pieces of content and really grow an audience. Um, but I think it, it goes back to what Jordi and I were saying is that anyone's capable of creating this kind of content and anyone can, um, you know, learn from that and use their mobile phone just as any other organization can, right? It very much evens the playing field. Um, in terms of specific examples, I might hand that over to Jordi. Um, I don't know if you've seen any examples that, that are more grassroots campaigns, um, but I will say, uh, especially in the US, a lot of our um, kind of recent political interests and, and nonprofits have, have really started using social media as more of a grassroots way to grow. Um, I know just a quick example from my head is uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is in our um, House of Representatives in New York State. She grew her campaign on social media just from knocking on people's doors, speaking at bars to 10 people at a time. And she went from having a, you know, a couple thousand followers to having over, you know, several million followers because people really resonate with her message and what she has to say. And that was done on a shoestring budget. Um, obviously, that's a political example, but she was only working with uh, low level donors. So donors that were donating less than a couple hundred dollars. Um, and so it is possible to kind of have that that catalyst for change and that growth if your message resonates with the right people. Um, Jordi, if you have any examples or things you want to add. No, nothing that directly comes to mind, but I was thinking about um, those Instagram takeovers. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you're, if your budget is relatively small or you don't have a lot of experience with social media, it's, it's quite easy to just give someone access to your account and just yeah. let them be your social media chief for a day. So maybe some of your staff members are doing something fun, they've got a nice event, just give them the logins, tell them, create a couple of stories about this event. Um, you can also include young people, let them be the ambassador for your organization for a day or a week or a month. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, 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 that's an easy way to make it authentic. It's an easy way to create stories. It's also an easy way to, to include more faces. So you, do, you don't need to vet an ambassador. You can just include people from your organization and that will make it a story, but also very much human centric. Um, so that, that's, 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 that's a way you can make something look authentic, credible on, on, a, on, a, on a zero euros budget. Yeah, and you can also, um, going off of that, you just gave me an idea. Um, 
I, when I do trainings on LinkedIn, for example, um, LinkedIn company pages in themselves don't really create growth, but what creates growth on LinkedIn is the people who work at that company that are evangelizing about that company or organization. And it's kind of the same with Instagram too, right? Except obviously organization pages are much more valuable on Instagram, but uh, point being is that you can have your employees and your supporters kind of evangelize your cause as well, and you can encourage them to share it. So if you're doing an Instagram takeover, for example, um, that person who's doing that Instagram takeover should also be promoting it on their private account because then that demonstrates that that social currency of saying this is a legitimate thing that I'm doing and it's something that that you should care about and something that you know I want my followers to listen to. So you can really drive kind of these new avenues of audiences um, to your to your account that way. Um, so if you have employees that that are active on Instagram. Uh, encourage them to speak out about these causes and try to, you know, mobilize their friends and then their friends' friends and so on and so forth because that's really what creates grassroots movements, right? That's that's the that's the whole uh, heart of it is is you know having a compelling message and then getting people to continue to evangelize that uh, over a period of time. So we have a question actually. Are there any, Are there any good administrative free apps from planning content? Do you mean do you mean like a content calendar, Andrea? Okay. Um, I know Buffer has that feature. I don't know if it's with a free account. I don't know if you know that, Jordy, but I think from what I've gathered, Buffer and Hootsuite have like a content kind of like calendar where if you schedule a post, you can go look at the calendar and it'll like have that full view of what you have scheduled. Yeah, there's limitations on it with Buffer. So yeah. So it's possible on these kinds of tools, but I think you have to pay for that feature. Um, yeah, only three accounts for free. Yeah, exactly. But if you're an organization that just uses, let's say, like Instagram and Facebook, then you can kind of do it that way. Um, or if you want to be really hacky, which is like what I used to do for some clients where I would like make a couple emails, like a couple work emails, and then have two different setups of free accounts <laughs> or something. Uh, <laughs> There's always a solution. Um, yeah, so I would I would say, uh, I don't know if there's a free one that would have like full capabilities, but there are free versions with kind of like a limited access version of that. Um, so I would say Hootsuite and Buffer are probably your first places to look. Um, if you need to pay for it, I think that's just kind of the reality of it now. I don't know if you know of any, Jordy. Um, I think you have to no, pay Yeah, Hootsuite, but. Yeah. Uh, their um, limitations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do it kind of more manually, um, I'm trying to think. I think HubSpot has quite a few like downloadable templates where you can create like an Excel spreadsheet of planned content if that's what you're into. Um, that's super tedious to keep updated though. So I wouldn't immediately recommend that. But I guess if you have the time to do it and if you really need to plan your content, that's that's one solution is just looking for a downloadable template. And then kind of creating your own. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. It, it, it doesn't have to be that time consuming. Exactly. So when I run campaigns, especially with teams, it's it just create a, a form in Google Drive or somewhere right. else. Just just put a simple Excel sheet in there and then exactly. for people to cross off the content once it's posted. It can be yeah. super easy. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it will cost a bit more time than uh, paying for Hootsuite. Exactly. Yeah, you can. Um, you can also just transfer Excel templates into a Google Drive sheet, just so then it's shareable and it's like a, a living document rather than just like a static one that you have to constantly update. Um, but yeah, it is going to take time. So for me personally, I think paying the ten or twenty dollars a month might be worth it if you're very committed to content planning, um, just because it will save you more time than it's worth in the end, but that's a personal choice. So it's whatever you think makes the most sense. <laughs>